Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause as we go on the digital transformation journey, phase two. So good morning all. As you know, my you name is coffee? Mike Antonius and I'm here with... Hina, Hina. Patty from Cerulean. Nice meeting you. And you. <laughs> Okay, um, you probably have a question why I'm with my Lakers jersey. You will understand later in the presentation, so um, I will not elaborate on that now. Last year, we were here talking about our digital transformation journey within Telesur. Those of you who have been here, um, I have explained what we're doing with regard to our digital transformation. It is very important, first of all, to know what your current stage is. We can talk about all type of technologies which there are available, but if you do not uh, are aware of your current stage, then all those type of technologies will just be fairy tales. The technologies are there for you, for us, to be implemented within our organization, but we must look at what is the stage of our uh, internal digitalization. We have talked a lot about connectivity. You have seen the presentations when it, um, before, um, um, earlier this morning, with regard to connectivity and how we can achieve a gigabit society by 2030. Within this presentation, we will focus a lot on how can we uh, create a, a, a seamless customer journey uh, when it comes to digital transformation. That is the main reason for within of my organiz organization that we were looking at what can we do differently. If I'm, um, we are in a, the incumbent company in Suriname, Telesur has a lot of legacy equipment within our network, within our infrastructure, and we're phasing that out gradually. And I'm very proud here that I can stand before you that um, we have reached the point where we were able to put out all the different platforms which were in silos, that we phased that out and that we have right now one platform which um, enables us from the order of the customer till the collection of cash that all is within one platform. But bef um, before I, we go into that, I will say something about the um, have this. without our company. Not sure. This is it. <laughs> Press one. Yeah. There you go. So, Telesur was established in '81. I just mentioned we're the incumbent national telecom operator. We're a full licensed operator, a critical contributor to Suriname's infrastructure and connectivity. And also, I have mentioned yesterday that we're rolling out fiber to the home nationally and we also have 5G services in downtown area. We stopped um, um, with expanding 5G because it doesn't make any sense if, for instance, most of the customers cannot experience 5G services. As I mentioned in my opening speech, that is a big obstacle because one of the biggest handsets providers is doing uh, not, very, it's not very cooperative when it comes to approving our network. Um, and that is not only with regard to uh, my case in Suriname, but throughout the Caribbean, because uh, in their perspective, we're too small and they're dealing with bigger um, um, operators. So we're a dominant player in Suriname, and that's about it, uh, briefly about Telesur and now uh, Hina. So, so the, their chosen uh, partner in this digital transformation journey is Cerulean. Uh, Cerulean was established in 1999. This year is our 25th birthday. I'm sure we're going to celebrate it really well. Uh, we are the leading provider, uh, one of the leading providers in billing, charging, and customer management. Uh, we offer a pre-integrated suite of products 
They can be deployed individually and they can be deployed together. But the benefit of our suite is that it is pre integrated. We offer flexible, scalable solutions for all types of operators, whether you're a single service provider or a multi service provider. We've uh, been in the region for around 20 years now. Might not have been around um, at Canto, but we've been in the region for 20 years. Uh, and we support all kinds of operators from traditional players to more digital players. And we have offices globally. So now move on to the next slide. Why was it necessary for us to transform? First of all, we were looking at uh, to reduce technology debt. We were looking at, um, as I mentioned, phasing out all type of legacy. Um, also, we were looking to have one single system for order to delivery to cash. Um, in the past, um, where, where there were several platforms with all type of uh, manhandling, which also result in, in errors. And that wasn't good for the business, especially when you're thinking to, for instance, the new type of technologies. It is, you're totally not able to apply uh, AI within platforms when they are in silos. So it was another important step for us to look at this foundation. Uh, better revenue assurance, uh, also related to the previous remark I made. Those um, 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 platforms and silos also result in, in, in errors and it has a big impact on revenue assurance, which we have uh, also experienced. And maybe, Hina, you can give an example of um, that. Yeah, I think uh, we talked about this last year, where um, at the end of the phase one go live, we discovered that there were around 20,000 mobile services that were not in the BSS. So there are about 20,000 people with mobile phones enjoying the free <laughs> service, thanks to, to Telesur. Yes. And as soon as the cutover happened, they got disconnected. They got disconnected. So I'm not here to give you like a, 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 a smooth presentation of how beautiful things are. I'm here to give you a realistic overview. And that also means that I will talk about the, 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 the ugly things. OK, so uh, we, we also wanted to achieve operational efficiencies. We wanted uh, to be able to react faster so that there is a better time to market. Also looking at simplification of processes and products and improve the customer journey. And that, therefore, we needed a secure platform. So it was a long journey. And if I have to do this over again, <laughs> I have learned so much that it would not take so long. For instance, we wrote an RFP twice because the first time we wrote the RFP, and the thing is, again, mindset. You work on the RFP with the mindset of what your current situation is. So you put a lot of the current situation into the RFP, but that is not where you're heading to. That is not what you want to become. So you're constantly working with what you already have. So um, I am also, Telesur is also a member of Teleforum. Teleforum is just like Canto, but small state, smaller group, only C-suite. And we, um, that organization is in Europe, and they are very eager to share knowledge. And one of the um, operators within that organization went through this process. So after we wrote the first RFP, I attended the Teleforum with my colleague Stephen. And we realized, man, we're messing up. We need to get back to the drawing board. So we wrote a new RFP. We, I, I sent some of my team members to uh, visit that company so that they could you know, have a better view. And then is when uh, we worked on the, the second RFP. And it took almost two years. That part of the RFP took almost two years. It can be faster, and uh, of course, if you know um, the experience I have now, I would not do it the same way. So we, we had uh, eventually the tender. Also, one of the delays was the COVID, the pandemic. It was all done during the pandemic. And um, that impacted us, but it didn't stop us. It didn't stop us because, because we were determined to achieve this. And I think, I think both teams worked 
really well, even remotely, yes. um, to get to a stage mm -hmm. where you could do all of the requirements and get up to the uh, integration testing part on site, which would have been needed to be on site. But we got so much of the work done beforehand just through Teams calls and being remote. So I guess the lesson here is that if you have the de determination to do it, you will find a way. Definitely, I agree on that. So um, there were several um, suppliers that participated in the tender, and uh, in the end, we chose for Cerulean. And with Cerulean, we worked uh, forward with regard to uh, this digital journey. Um, the project started in 21, 22, still in the pandemic. And that is when we kicked it off. So you can see from 2016 to 21 was all only preparation. Um, and still, if I look at the preparation that we have done and we, uh, we, I look at where we are now, there are still so many things that we could have done different. But okay, you need to move forward and you, we will, I know we will come to a stage where we will keep on updating and improving. But the thing is, you need to start. So we started in 21. We had uh, multiple migration runs, all type of dress rehearsals. Um, in that stage, and that is where um, last year when I was here with Hina in July, that we presented to you that we went live in, uh, with mobile. Another thing is, this transformation was not only about, uh, for instance, uh, mobile, it was it were all our services. We are a full license operator, that means it's about fix, it is about mobile. In our perception, we, um, uh, the way our uh, services were um, defined, um, it is like we are we having two networks, and we wanted to change that to become one network, like an integral network with fixed and mobile, also known as convergence, which we want to apply. Therefore, this was necessary. It is a big, big step. Um, uh, Data cleansing is very much required, and there was a lot to be cleansed. So eventually, we decided to do it in two stages, a phase one and a phase two. The phase one was mobile, and July, the 1st of July, which is also our Emancipation Day, we um, went live with mobile. I think it's also fair to say that uh, at the initial stage of the project, your phase one and phase two were quite different. They were prepaid and postpaid, and yeah. it was changed to be mobile and then fixed. Yes. So I guess co working collaboratively, being flexible, we were able to change course based on your requirements. Yes, thank you for adding that. In this picture, you could see the celebrations of the go live in July last year. So one of the highlights, uh, phase one, we did the migration of mobile services for both postpaid and prepaid into the Cerulean platform. Um, there were, of course, challenges. I mean, if there were no challenges, it would be very boring, but a lot of challenges. Uh, swapping out an online charging system that was challenging. Also, all type of vendor integrations, that was very challenging, very challenging to say it. In and challenging way. from the point of view that all of the vendors needed to be in communication with each other. If one went, vendor would change something, everything was so finely tuned that everybody else needed to be aware of it. Otherwise, it just didn't work. So really important when you've got multiple integrations going on that you keep all of your vendors in sync. And that will mean less headache for you when you go through that journey. Again, mindset, mindset of the part of my teams, mindset and the part of the vendors. In the past, if you do some upgrade, it is in a silo, it doesn't impact the other silo, but in this case, different way of working. So, uh, education of new self-service channels to the end user community, but also within, the, within my own organization was, very, was a big challenge. Um, one of the results was that we were able to reduce revenue uh, leakage. Um, Dina just mentioned that there were about 20,000 services that which were not um, uh, uh, been uh, built, charged. 
So we were able to uh, deactivate those surfaces, and that is, uh, of course, good for revenue assurance. And consistent and accurate billing is one of the uh, biggest uh, highlights in this case. Um, so, Hina, maybe you can yep. elaborate on this. So, as soon as we went live with um, mobile, of course, there was a settling in period. Um, but during that time in parallel, our teams were working towards the fixed line migration. And as part of phase two, we we're also replacing another silo system that contained all your lime plant data. And this is where we discovered a lot of the data cleansing uh, issues that existed. So you would have data in the network inventory, but it didn't exist in the BSS that you needed to migrate. So they were, that meant services were being provided for free. Or that you had somebody in BSS, but they didn't have a network element associated with them, which would mean that any post-sales activities that you wanted to do, whether that's upgrading their service to fiber or selling them something else, you wouldn't be able to do through an automated system like Cerulean. So what it shows when you do go through a transformation phase like this is where your gaps are. But the good news is once you've closed those gaps, you will have a much better data integrity between your network and your BS. Um, the benefits of the two-phased approach in this, I mean, Cerulean does both, um, but in this case, the two phases really, really benefited both parties. And in particular for Telesur, the team became more experienced in the use of Cerulean. They became used to the screens. They knew where things were when they're doing the UAT testing. Uh, again, you put in more resources for testing. Customer care teams also understood more about the system, were able to articulate to us what their requirements are if they were not there. And aligning the business processes to work with the Cerulean system rather than trying to shoehorn old processes into the new system. Yeah, so definitely I want to emphasize on testing. We've made a great progress the moment we were able to uh, put some uh, team, uh, members on, on this project who were constantly testing, giving feedback to Cerulean, constantly testing, and that really uh, made us uh, make steps forward. So um, lessons learned applied in phase two. The cutover was smooth, but it has all uh, everything to do with the preparation, how we were prepared for it. That's uh, one of the biggest reasons why the cutover was smooth. Um, and uh, there was a good planning, and definitely one of the, the lessons learned is we did multiple dress rehearsals just to make sure that we are on the right track and that uh, to eliminate all type of risks. We had um, a lot of training of employees, um, a lot of training, the full engagement of the C-suite um, of my organization, and together with the testing teams. It is not something that you can say, oh, it is something of the IT department, let them fix it. No, it is a full focus of the whole organization from, from sales till um, uh, uh, the finance team, very important, that part of the finance team. One of my lessons learned is my finance team realized too late what the impact would be on our, on, on our business, too late. So, so definitely, I would advise, um, if you are planning to do something like this, put your finance team in front, put your IT team in the back, your finance team in front, your commercial team in front. For instance, <laughs> For instance, if you want to do something like this, we started too late with the customer journey. And uh, uh, one, definitely one good recommendation is think of your co digital customer journey before you write your RFP and put the input of your digital customer journey into your RFP of what you want to become because eventually this will result in all type of online services you can offer to your customer and how they can order from their living room and pay for those services. Um, benefits of phase two? Hina. Yeah, I mean, the, obviously all 
customers, except some nano services which are yet to be brought into Cerulean, are in Cerulean now, which means that you have a single platform, a single view of all of your customer base. We have improved the network and data integrity. There are still some challenges that we're working through today where we're correcting the data. And that's also really, really important that getting your data clean before any migration is a lot less painful than trying to do it afterwards, right? So we added on the online sales part of the self-service platform. So in phase one, we just had the My Account. How do I register? How do I manage my account? And in phase two, you could actually buy a service from there. We now have uh, real-time analytics based on the SciSense platform that you already had. So really it's just providing the data for that SciSense platform. Uh, again, they can react faster to uh, market dynamics from the reports by using the CEPC platform, which is very, very dynamic. And of course, they now have better security based on latest technologies. So um, we're now going to wrap up um, the three yeah, the, P's of digital transformation. I thought, I thought we would go on the theme of this canto where cable and wireless had their three C's, Bahamas had their three S's. So four S's, four, four S's. Four, four, sorry. And then Julian probably somewhere has five for Antigua. So uh, <laughs> we thought we'd start with our three P's of digital transformation. Yeah, so the first P is people, and there he comes, Kobe Bryant. <laughs> Mindset, change of management, and how to apply that. The Mamba mentality, this is, uh, I'm a great fan of him. So rest in peace. Mamba mentality is focusing all about focusing on the process and trusting in the hard work when it matters the most. Determination. I love sports, and how can you not love Kobe? So with this mindset, we were trying to move our teams to stay determined, focused, without ever challenge or setback, we're gonna move forward and we're gonna, it will result in a win. So we did training, a lot of collaboration, commitment, full C-suite support, determination, and persistence. So that is one important part of one of the three Ps. Processes, uh, processes we needed to simplify a lot of processes. Our processes were from uh, the previous millennium, so a lot of simplifying was required. Not re-implementing old processes in a new system. And that is definitely what we did in the first part of the RFP, and still we saw some of those things in the second part of the RFP. Practice, best practice workflows were also something that we needed to look at. Project processes and preparation got, um, are key with regard to the cutover and testing all processes. Um, and at last, governance from the C-suite. I cannot emphasize that enough. You and know? obviously, platform and partner, that's us. Um, choosing the right platform that is future-proof for your and where you want to go. So it's not just looking at your your organization today, but where you want to be in 10 years' time. So uh, uh, an organization that's evolving with new technologies that's part of the Open API uh, program, allowing for ease of integration into the future so you can swap in, swap out things a lot easier, and you have your base still intact. And partnering with an organization that is invested in your success and works collaboratively towards that. Very important to work collaboratively. Okay, um, it's a journey, it's not a destination. You can see here when we celebrated, I had the same jersey on <laughs> because um, it was the mindset that I tried to bring over to my teams. So when we celebrated, I was there with the, with the Mamba jersey. 
Integrity between network and BSS reduced revenue leakage. Automated simplified processes, single charging, prepaid, postpaid, mobile, and fixed were one, uh, uh, one of the results coming forward from this. A single source of the truth, not several um, uh, sources which I had to deal with in the past. Real-time analytics, um, something we didn't have in the past as well. Now we have a faster time to market. We improved our digital engagement with our customers. Um, and I must say that after the cut over, we still are uh, experiencing some challenges. It is not all that, um, that, that. No, it wasn't all smooth, but. <laughs> There's, there are some things to approve because we still have some challenges with data. Yeah. Okay, yeah. we now have one bill for all services. That was not the case in the past. And it, it gives us the opportunity to um, continuous improve. We need to wrap it up now yep. because we're so, over time. Lessons learned. Again, finance, finance, finance. Have your finance team involved. And again, actually all departments within your organization should be part of this journey. Documenting your end-to-end -end solution and your processes is critical. Again, don't try and shoehorn old processes into a new platform and rationalize your products before the project starts. And choose a partner, not a supplier. Again, and this is my hero, <laughs> Mandela, so I put this one in. Um, it always seems impossible until it's done. But you need his mamba mentality <laughs> to get it done. So that was our presentation for today. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mike Antonio, CEO of Telesor, and Hina Patney, account manager, Cerulean. The Mamba mentality put finance ahead. Finance was very happy to hear that. Building the customer journey before we even issue the RFP for successful digital transformation. Thank you very much again for that great presentation. Another round of applause. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to introduce His Excellency Urakit Hanafi Ramsaran. He took office as Minister of Social Affairs and Public Housing in the Republic of Suriname on July 16, 2020. Under the supervision of Minister Ramsaran, the Ministry of Social Affairs and Public Housing has worked on digital transformation in which social benefits have been digitalized nationally from the city to the furthest areas in the interior. Minister Ramsaran has tried to bring digital inclusivity because he insists that no one is left behind. On December 13th, 2023, Minister Ramsaran took office at the Department of Transport, Communications, and Tourism. Currently, he's working on the digitalization within the transport sector to bring order. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the socially committed, dynamic, visionary leader, the Minister of Transport, Communication, and Tourism of the Republic of Suriname, His Excellency Urakit Hanafi Ramsaran. Please give him a rousing canto welcome. I think I am one of the Canto virgins. <laughs> yeah. Let's start with the formal part. Chairman of the Canto, Mr. Mike Antonius. Vice Chairman, Mr. Del Rio Newman, Secretary General of the Canto, Mrs. Teresa Wankin, colleague ministers of the different countries, representatives of different countries and organizations, exhibitors, media, ladies and gentlemen. From this location, 
I wish you a good and blessed afternoon. Seven continents and more than 8.1 billion people. Nowadays, we are more connected to each other due to digitalization growth of telecommunication and information technology. Now, before I continue, I would like to pay respect. Respect to the brothers and sisters of ours within the Caribbean for the past couple of days. The Caribbean has been hit by the hurricane barrel. It has been mentioned a couple of times. But let's not forget that by the hit of Hurricane Barrel, people have lost their loved ones. People have lost their homes. To these brothers and sisters of ours, I would like to pay my respect and wish them all the strength, power, and blessings. During the different sessions and while speaking with my colleagues, I was happy to hear. Happy to hear that the telecommunication network of lots of countries that has been hit especially has been restored. Why? It has been restored, and I'm happy with that, because a lot of the people can stay in contact, be in contact, and stay in contact with their loved ones, simply to check up on them. But to continue, as the Minister of Transport, Communication, and Tourism of the Republic of Suriname, it is a great, a great honor for me to address you at the 39th Kento meeting on behalf of the government of Suriname regarding the transformative power of digital technology and its profound implications on the development of my country. Suriname underlines the importance of long-term possibilities, including what they can realize for our country development and the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. Many of the actions and activities needed to accelerate the digital part are multi-year commitments, but we must start somewhere or after some time, and that somewhere or sometime is now. An important saying is, and we have heard a couple of them today, is, if not now, then when? As the former Minister of Social Affairs and Public Housing, currently as the Minister of Transport, Communication, and Tourism, I have made a strong case for digitalization, especially if we're looking at the weak households, the people with disability, etc. Under the leadership of President His Excellency Chandrika Prasad Santoki and the Vice President His Excellency Ronnie Brunswijk at the Ministry of Social Affairs and Public Housing, we ensured that all social benefits for senior citizens and children, financial assistance for people with disability, financial assistance for weak households, and the purchasing power reinforcement for weak households have been digitized. In the context of our motto, leaving no one behind, we have provided all benefit recipients with a beneficiary card. We have ensured digital transformation, but even more so, the inclusivity of everyone from the city to far to the furthest interior of Suriname. I don't just say this, but as many of you know, Suriname is the most forested country in the world, and we are part of the Amazon, meaning that there are places that are difficult to reach. But nonetheless, we have made sure that we include everyone and leave no one behind, as so we must also leave no one behind as Kanto. Ladies and gentlemen, the government of Suriname is currently working on digitalization in various areas, including digitalization of the transport sector for organization and clarity, but are also on the verge of an oil and gas boom in Suriname. The developments in this sector are very promising for the growth of our economy. However, to truly harness its potential and ensure that its benefits reach every citizen, we must embrace a comprehensive digital transformation. We must ensure that our citizens are adequately equipped to embrace the opportunities the developments in this industry will bring. Digital transformation is not merely a buzzword. It is a necessity for our times. It represents a, holo a holistic reimagining of how we operate, leveraging advanced technologies to enhance efficiency and productivity. In the context of the oil and gas industry, digital transformation can rev revolutionize our approach making our operations smarter, 
more resilient, more effective, and more responsive to the needs of our people. In an industry as complex and capital intensive as oil and gas, there is no space for mistakes. That is how important this industry is, because a minor inefficiency can lead to significant losses. Digital technologies such as advanced data analysis, artificial intelligence, and the Internet of Things, IoT, offer powerful tools to optimize every facet of the operations. From exploration and drilling to refining and distribution, these technologies enable us to gather and analyze vast amounts of data in real time. This insight allows for a predictive maintenance, reducing downtime, and optimizing resource allocation. Ultimately, these efficiencies translate into low, lower operational costs and higher output, ensuring that we maximize the value derived from our natural resources. Ladies and gentlemen, transparency and accountability are con cornerstones of good governance and essential for maintaining public trust. Digital transformation facilities, it, facil it, it, it facilitates these by enabling more transparent and accountable management of our oil and gas resources. By leveraging digital platforms, we can also ensure that data related to resource extraction, revenue generation, and expenditure in readily available to stakeholders, including the public. Let's not forget the public. One of the most significant advantages of digital transformation is its potential to directly benefit our citizens. By, streaming, by streamlining operations and increasing efficiency, we can generate more revenue, which can be reinvested in essential services such as healthcare, infrastructure, education, and other social measurements towards the citizens. Moreover, digital technologies can improve the delivery of these services, making them more accessible and responsive to the needs of our people. For example, telemedicine can bring healthcare to remote communities, and an e-learning platform can provide educational opportunities to children who previously lacked access because let's not forget, ladies and gentlemen, because the children of today are the future of tomorrow. Furthermore, digital transformation creates new economic opportunities for the citizens. As the oil and gas industry modernizes, there is a growing demand for skilled professionals in fields such as data analysis, software development, and cybersecurity. Things that we have heard. By investing in digital education and training, we can equip our workforce with the skills needed to thrive in this evolving landscape, fostering, especially this one, job creation and economic growth. Digital transformation also extends to environmental sustainability. Advanced monitoring and control systems enable us to minimize the environmental impact of our operations by optimizing resource usage and reducing emissions, we can protect our natural heritage for future generations. Additionally, digital technologies facilitates the development of cleaner and more efficient energy solutions, supporting our transition to a more sustainable energy future. To achieve these goals, we must adopt a multifaceted approach. This includes investing in digital infrastructure, fostering innovation through research and development, and creating and enabling a regulatory environment that supports digital initiatives. Collaboration between government, industry, and academia is crucial to driving this transformation forward. Moreover, we must ensure that our digital transformation efforts are inclusive, leaving no one behind. This means addressing the digital divide providing access to digital tools and technologies across urban and rural, and promoting digital literacy among our citizens. Ladies and gentlemen, that is why I am glad that the 39th Canto meeting has been organized. It has brought government, authorities, and the private sector all together with a vision of digital transformation can be shared, but also ideas and experiences. So, I would like to take this opportunity 
and compliment the chairman of the Canto, Mr. Mike Antonius, for his great leadership, but also his commitment. <laughs> chairman, you deserve this. Together with the chairman, Mr. Mike Antonius, we also take along the vice chairman, the SG, and his team together. You have done an excellent job as chairman of the organization in taking firm steps forward. You can take any steps, but take firm ones. That is the quality that we need to bring forward. Ladies and gentlemen, we must keep in mind that the digital transformation of the oil and gas sector is not just an opportunity, it is an imperative for Suriname and others. By embracing digital technologies, we can unlock unprecedented efficiencies, enhance transparency, empower our citizens, and ensure sustainable development. Because together, we can build a bright future, not just for us now, but for the generations ahead. Let us embark on this journey with determination and foresight, harnessing the power of digital transformation to create a more prosperous and inclusive future for each and everyone, because we are leaving no one behind. Thank you very much. May God protect and bless us all. Thank you very much, His Excellency Urakit Ramsaran. Can I ask for a bigger round of applause and could we get to our feet and thank His Excellency for that very passionate presentation. No one will be left behind. We are building the future, not just for us, but for the generations to come. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. At this time, I'd like to welcome our moderator, Lisa Agard, Canto C9 Committee Chair. She will be leading the discussion, Strategies for Ensuring Equitable Access to Broadband Services. Lisa, please welcome Lisa. <laughs> Good afternoon. I am merely the moderator. The person that you have really come to listen to is the person who will deliver the keynote address on this topic, uh, who is Mignon Clyburn. Yesterday when I had lunch with Mignon, I asked her if in deference to all of the things that are happening in France, could I refer to her as Mignon for today? And I was told quite clearly, I'm from South Carolina. It's Mignon. Mignon Clyburn, I am proud to say, became the first black female to head the Federal Communications Commission in May 2013, when she was appointed acting chair following her second appointment to the Federal Commission by President Barack Obama. Clyburn began her public service career at the FCC in August 2009 after spending 11 years as a member of the 6th District on the Public Service Commission of South Carolina. She served as its chair from July 2002 through, through June 2004. Prior to her service on the PSE, Clyburn was the publisher and general manager of the Coastal Times a Charleston, South Carolina-based weekly newspaper that focused primarily on issues affecting the African-American community. She co-owned and operated the family-founded newspaper for 14 years. A longtime champion of consumers and a defender of the public interest, Commissioner Clyburn was a strong advocate for enhanced accessibility in communications for disabled citizens. She pushed quite strongly for affordable universal telephone and high-speed internet access, greater broadband deployment, and adoption throughout the nation, and transparency in regulation. Commissioner Clyburn is still committed to narrowing persistent digital communication and opportunity divides that challenge rural, native, African-American, Latino, 
and low wealth communities. Specifically, she pushed for the modernization of the FCC's Lifeline program, which helps defray the cost of voice and broadband services for low income consumers. She fought to promote strong competition across all communications platforms, championed diversity in media ownership, initiated reforms in the egregious inmate calling services regime, emphasized diversity and inclusion in STEM opportunities, and was a strong advocate for preserving a free and open internet or net neutrality. Clyburn held a fellowship at the Open Society Foundation where she championed efforts to eliminate pre predatory rates for prison telephone services before they established MLC strategies, an independent consulting firm in January 2019. She graduated from the University of South Carolina in 1984 with a bachelor's degree in banking, finance, and economics. Please, let us give a very warm welcome to Mignon Clyburn. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, I am from South Carolina. You didn't hear it. I'm going to try it again. Good afternoon, everyone. So we had this uh, uh, thing in my culture called call, call and response, uh, and, and, and so I embraced that from my uh, church upbringing, and thank you for indulging <laughs> me. So allow me to thank Committee Chair Agard for that very generous introduction, and each of you for making my f inaugural canto, oh, canto, as we say here, I, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling <laughs> the spirit, uh, this experience rewarding. After hearing a number of presentations over the past three days, I cannot help but lift a passage from a 2020 Brookings Institution research publication. And it reads this. Broadband is so influential on society that we would now call it essential infrastructure. That means affordable subscription prices, universal access to connected devices, and a population equipped with digital skills are now vital characteristics of a healthy neighborhood, city, state, or country. The silver anniversary of my utility regulatory journey is behind me. And like many of you who have been out here for a while, I can point to at least a half dozen technological, policy, legal, and societal transformations in basic ICT that continue to change the way we live, work, play, and dream. From the Bell divestiture in 1984 to the first commercial provider of dial-up access to the internet in 1989, to the release of the non-proprietary code that became the World Wide Web in 1993, to the Telecommunications Act of 1996 here in the state, states, those and other developments have resulted in multiple flavors of broadband access we enjoy today, including the dozens of universities and colleges that now offer degrees in artificial intelligence, a discipline that will undoubtedly shape the manner in which we consume broadband. And while we each can point to great successes in deploying broadband in our communities, increasing penetration rates and wider reaches in unserved and underserved populations, there is still a lot of work to be done to ensure that every person who wants it and could benefit from it has access to affordable, reliable, and robust broadband service. We have heard many presenters share samplings of strategies for ensuring equitable access to broadband services. Here in the US, this is primarily viewed through the lens of policies of Cong and policies of Congress, the National Telecommunications and Information Association, and yes, my old professional home, the Federal Communications Commission. My single point for this segment before you head out to lunch is to further encourage you to consider how multiple strategies or their successful components 
no matter their country of origin, may be adopted and tailored to your special or unique set of circumstances, and that no matter how difficult or how long this path toward digital inclusion may take, never walk away from the collaborative approaches and the formation of creative solutions. After all, none of us is as smart as all of us. It is important to acknowledge that strategies for ensuring equitable access to broadband services here in the states has not been a quick, easy, singular, or one-dimensional effort. Building infrastructure, expanding access, ensuring affordability, promoting digital literacy, and fostering competition have been pursued through multiple congressional bills and federal state funding programs, several regulatory frameworks, and oversight by more than one federal agency, including the FCC. With its legislative mandates, public interest standard, use of market analysis and research, and international considerations, the FCC has expanded its universal service mission to both telecommunications and advanced services with the passage of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. The releasing of the National Broadband Plan in March of 2010, funded by the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, laid down a blueprint during a critical time in our technological evolution. Through a series of reforms came the Connect America Fund, which included mobility funds that provided 10 years of support for wireless services primarily in rural areas, and a reverse auction, if you remember, in 20, the summer of 2019, that brought about the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund that provided additional support for broadband infrastructure in unserved and underserved rural areas. But by far, the most ambitious and talked about strategy undertaken to date was the 2021 enactment of the Bipartisan Infrastructure and Investments and Jobs Act. Once, this is a once in a lifetime effort that recognized the importance and essential nature of broadband and multiple efforts needed to make that ubiquitous. And while $65 billion is a big number, maybe not to some of you, but it's a big number to me, and connecting 333 plus million people is a big task, none of this works anywhere in the world, no matter the population size or budget, and the absence of concrete, well-developed strategies, accountability, unambiguous policies, proper oversight, clear me measurements that ensure equitable access, the promotion of competition, network reliability and resiliency, and secure networks. Soon after I took the oath to become a federal commissioner, I delivered to some what must have appeared to be a sobering message in the midst of all of the excitement about building new broadband networks. 90% of the discussions that I took part in about connecting that last mile to the premise was about building next generation infrastructure. But our office doubled down on bifurcating that refrain by saying that this effort was actually the tale of not one, but two half miles. One half is all about building that much needed infrastructure everywhere possible. But the other equally important half mile was about adoption. That, ad that uh, adage, build it and they will come, will never ever happen if those who would benefit from being connected the most cannot afford it, don't know how to use it, or won't touch it due to fears of being harmed online. 
Now, if my friend Alicia Tambe of the FCC were up here with me, along with her colleagues, Karen O'Brien and Narda Jones, who you met earlier, and of course, I cannot help but mention my uh, former colleague, Brian Carter, they would each remind us that while we are collectively closing the coverage gap around the world, we still have a long way to go before closing the usage gap. Building digital skills, ensuring online safety, leveraging our strengths with multi-stakeholder and public-private partnerships, instituting flexible, the word here is flexible regulatory policies all the way down to the local level with transparent, streamlined permitting and zoning rules that hold all parties accountable ensuring that these incredible opportunities are available to those with physical and cognitive challenges and not giving up or giving in if the first series of plans fail. You see, the word resilience should not only apply to networks. Resilience is needed from and by each of us when it comes to finding workable and enabling solutions to conquer our most persistent challenges, particularly when it has been proven and shown that these challenges can be lessened with a broadband connection. And as I move from this lectern to a chair to speak more, I cannot help but close with a mention of our Federal Universal Service Fund. As you know, USF is paid by contributions from telecommunications carriers, including wireline and wireless companies and interconnected voice over the internet protocol providers. But due to dramatic shifts that we've been hearing about, especially all morning, from traditional telecommunications providers, the revenue from USF has declined sharply. And while the services that USF enables have expanded, the debate is on about what should we do next. Does this sound familiar to you? Without a shift, it is predicted that the telecommunications provider's contribution factor could reach what some already feel is an unsustainable level in just a few years. Now, I raise this in the backdrop of the debate that you have been talking about, about for some time on fair share. Now, my understanding is at the heart of this are concerns regarding equitable access to ICT resources and infrastructure. And similar to some of the debates with USF, among the challenges desired to be addressed are infrastructure disparities, affordability, skills and literacy, and of course, the digital uh, divide. And while my politics won't allow me to weigh into that debate, though I am real tempted. I will share the obvious, that these issues are not easy to resolve. Not here in the US, not in your region, not around the globe. We all have that in common. And while none of us should be so bold or arrogant to suggest that any one person or one company has the ultimate answer, what I am saying in a most comfortable way, based on experience, is that it's critically important to, one, begin with a commitment to a public policy objective for the region, continue to build consensus around that objective with all stakeholders, and those stakeholders are growing by the day, and never stray from that goal or North Star, no matter how heated things get. Now, I know this is easier said than done. Nevertheless, it is a critically important to, to default, always default to that North Star every time things get a little shaky in the room. And remind ourselves of one thing for sure, that there is strength in numbers, and the only sustainable path forward is if we come up with a plan together. Two, secure agreement. Thank you. Secure agreement on what you actually want and what it takes to get there. 
Then the real challenging, sometimes fun, part if you think fun and challenge and hard work are, are, are fun, then the real fun begins, that takes part or takes place when it comes to what regulatory, business, and economic models must be to developed to reach those objectives. I think inherent to any type of activity that is difficult, it is important for us to be real with each other and ourselves. Ask ourselves if our current models are working. Are they working? Be bold and creative if that answer is no. Three, collaborate and build on common ground. Each party's unique interests will continue to cause friction. That's a given. Politics and personality will stay on display. You've met me, I've met some of you. Politics and personalities will stay on display. That is to be expected, that is a given, but just about every challenge has a workable solution, and our communities have earned and deserve workable solutions. Can and should alternatives be viewed through a sector-specific lens? These are the type of questions we need to ask. Should there be sector-specific taxes? And if that dream or nightmare is, is something that you want to uh, continue to discuss, depending on where you stand, if any of those scenarios continue or become a, a reality, are those monies flowing directly back into this sector? And lastly, and I think most importantly, is recognizing that reliable, robust, and ubiquitous networks that benefits everyone. This mutually beneficial and undeniable virtuous cycle between providers and those who rely on the existence of these networks must never be lost on any of us. Each of us is positioned differently. Each industry has different profit margins and cost structures, and each nation has unique needs that often are shown or display themselves or are visible in uneven levels of investments when it comes to individual communities. But evenness and equity are not the same. Hardware margins and software or the writing of design code profit margins are not the same. And each path in achieving healthy digital ecosystems, they differ as well. But what, it is, what is clear is that each member nation here has the capacity to show large and small nations alike how ensuring equitable access can be done better, quicker, and more cost efficiently. I appreciate this opportunity and hope to spend a few more minutes uh, with you talking about how you must never, ever, ever have model envy because there are pluses and minuses even with the most long-standing legacy models, how studying every country's evolution and varied experiences are our greatest teachers, and how your unique challenges are actually gateways to unleashing your superpower, and your superpower is connecting successfully and affordably your communities. I thank you. One of the most significant international tools, as you will know, is the ITU IDI index, the International Development Index, mm -hmm. which after a hiatus of, I think, about five years, it, they published an index in 2023. And what that index does is it measures digital development, looking specifically at universal connectivity and meaningful connectivity of 169 countries around the world. Mm -hmm. Um, the score is out of 100, so they score both universal um, um, connectivity and meaningful connectivity and average the scores. Right. The United States is, as you, you, you would not be surprised to know, scored 96.6 .6 out of 100. So it is among 
the most digitally mature countries in the world as defined by the ITU. Yet, digital divide problems persist even in the United States. Hence, you mentioned the um, um, Biden-Harris passage of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act in 2021, which mm -hmm. unleashed $65 billion to bridge that dig digital divide. What lessons can we in the Caribbean learn from the United States as it, as it has ex clearly experienced its own challenges with bridging, bridging the digital divide and making sure that nobody is left behind in terms of broadband connectivity. So I will ask you, uh, ans I will answer that in a way that, um, and I often do this that will get me in trouble and it, it will be tough for, to we go like back trouble. home. Yeah, yeah it, it, it'll <laughs> be like tough. Good I, I want, um, <laughs> if I indeed get in trouble, I want every one of you to, um, to, to, to uh, embrace me. And, and I will tell you exactly how best to do that um, after I, uh, if I, I'm correct. Look, um, we have learned that though we have spent billions of dollars to date and we have allocated billions of more, millions more, it would be a miracle if we totally uh, eradicate the problem of that three or five percent, mm -hmm. um, you know, that mm -hmm. um, is uh, mm -hmm. that is mentioned, mm -hmm. and I don't discount that three to five percent. I used to say when I first got to the commission, when is ninety plus percent not an A? Is when whatever that delta is not connected. We do not get an A, no matter what that index says. We have um, a we need to continue to challenge our current infrastructures. Part of the issue, and I, I'm not going to even look at Narda from the FCC when I say this, <laughs> part of the issue is our legacy construct. And we have done things in the same way, sometimes with some of the same players, and they have conducted themselves in similar ways, and we have had similar results. How do we achieve levels of disruption within our own infrastructures in order to um, you know, look at that three, the 5% or whatever the figure is. And so uh, this is the biggest challenge any of us will face. We have built relationships. People have done things that we have been pleased with, but that last mile to get everyone connected is going to be one that maybe the current players and constructs are not the only ones uh, that should uh, move forward and, and be awarded. That is difficult, it's politically sensitive, um, but uh, again, having that broader and wider table uh, for those to be there, uh, we heard yesterday, like the clinical uh, professionals, mm -hmm. you know, like those in education, they can tell us what we need and the rest of us smart people uh, should develop and, um, and craft our uh, models to suit and to address them. That is how you get to the, whatever that delta of um, the disconnection, um, you know, in, in your communities. Listening to people first before being the smartest one in the room and crafting policies and building it and then you find uh, that it's not sufficient. That, I believe, is, is keeping us away from, um, no matter how, what the index is, from uh, connecting that last uh, sure. Sure. single digit percent. So, so you mentioned something that I thought is resonated very strongly with me and for us in the Caribbean in particular when you talked about there were there, there are two last mile or, or yeah. two half miles. Right. One is the um, last mile physical access right. and then the second um, half mile is getting and encouraging and ensuring adoption. Right. You have heard I think speakers yesterday and today in particular speak to the usage gap on the mobile side, which in the Caribbean they estimate, or just on the mobile side, to be about $2.4 billion. Mm -hmm. And on the fixed side, um, uh, the estimates are somewhere between five and nine billion US dollars. So there is clearly a very um, significant adoption gap right. uh, in the Caribbean, which speaks to fundamentally Sometimes affordability is not just coverage, 
its affordability right. as well. And the ITU speaks very clearly in its, um, the methodology that it employs to determine the scores at the IDI index is that they are about ensuring that everyone enjoys a safe, satisfying, enriching, productive online experience right. at an affordable cost. Given some of the challenges that you have heard that we have in the Caribbean with addressing usage gaps and affordability issues, do you have any recommendations for us as to how we could bridge that adoption gap in the Caribbean? I have often listened to people in my orbit um, and sometimes I run away from home and, and try to go, uh, you know, into, you know, other spheres um, also. And what, no matter, you, regardless of what it is, if it's political, if it's technical, people do not feel like they're listened to. Their needs are not put front and center. And so I'm going to be a little, a little repetitive here. And what we're not doing is our homework. It's not just about money, though mm -hmm. money would solve a lot of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just about uh, ensuring that someone knows how to sign up and sign on. And it's not just that. When you talk about improving and enhancing and, and ensuring that people will get the most out of these experiences, number one, you ask them which experiences we, uh, they prefer. One of the uh, biggest arguments I get in, or you, especially used to get in in the States, is people wanting to put most of the money on, you know, uh, fixed or, or, you know, what we call, you know, legacy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you being able to, with a hardwired yes. internet connection, connection, being able to access from home. But if most of us are mobile, if we have two and three jobs, if our preference is this device, why fight me? And so that's why people like me at the FCC fought for a mobility fund. That mm -hmm. was not an easy task. No. It looks easy on paper because it had a couple of phases. That was a big fight um, you know, with my colleagues. So the thing is, we need to really step, pause, and really take a, an assessment. Um, I, whatever it comes into, you know, a broadband plan, a series of charrettes or conversations with the community, and see what they need. Some things are obvious. There are educational gaps, there are healthcare gaps, there are literacy gaps. And how do those, how do you reach those through the best series of devices, the best series of, of, of trusted partners? This is the longest, most difficult, and in some ways most expensive in terms of time, input, part of this divide. But if we don't take our times and listen and, and address it, that number will never be 100. I don't care where you are or, yes. or what you are or, or what you did use. You can build it, you can craft it, you can, you can put bells, whistles, and, and, a, and a lottery wheel around it. It will not change. And so these are the things that we have to come home that we need to get out of our offices and out of our silos and go to these communities and say, what do you need and how best for us to achieve it? And have the smart people on the ground come up with the solution. Have homegrown talent, community talent, have contests, have all of these things so they can come with their solutions. And that, in my opinion, is the best way to spur adoption. If my kid develops something that is of use to me, I'm going to use it. If my neighbor did something that enhances my well-being, I'm going to adopt. Yes. And so these are the things that you, we, we know how we tick. Why do you think someone else you know, is, is, is fashioned differently? If it's familiar, if the person is familiar, if the introduction is familiar, I'm more apt to use it. And, and just one final question, because, you know, this is the session before lunch, right? Yeah, sorry. So <laughs> I'm, I'm hungry, too, so I'm not going to, yeah. Do you think, given our current construct in the Caribbean, and you've heard a lot of it in the last couple of days, should we be looking more to public-private partnerships to subs actually subsidize the provision of broadband, um, teach and develop digital skills and literacy? And how do we also encourage, because, you know, somebody said to me, 
So when we get the gigabit society, what are we doing with it? Uh. You know, it's like, what are we doing with it? No, because it's, a, it's an entire ecosystem right. that we are building. It's not just the access to high-speed broadband. It's what do you utilize that for? And so therefore, it has to be a national effort that speaks to digitalization of government services, right. digitalization of services provided by the private sector, um, opportunities for innovation, like that you just spoke about. Right. So should we be given our construct and our constraints, be looking more to public private partnerships to achieve some of our objectives? I think to get there quicker and faster, I don't want to sound like Steve, I'll say, if any of you watched Six Million Dollar Man way back, I'm really dating myself. Um, but if you watch that, you know, he talked about, you know, faster, um, stronger, Shonda, whatever. Yeah, I, I've yeah, forgotten because yeah. I'm, I'm 62, so I've forgotten half of it. But I do remember Steve Austin. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. That is the only way to put our thumb on the scale of getting them quicker, faster, and less expensively. We cannot do it alone. Most of your governments do not build it. You don't build it. No, the government is correct. not in the building. The government is in the, in the, in the enabling business, allocation yes. rules business, but not the building business. So absolutely. But when you define what a partner is, we need to, to not have any limitations placed on us. You know, your partner is that social service entity. Your partner is, I mean, it, it is broad and wide. And I want to leave this one thing to you. It's mm -hmm. beyond, because I, I didn't want to prolong my remarks. When we go back home and speak to our government officials, especially the ones with the purse strings, consider this. Now, I majored in banking and finance and economics, but don't check my transcript. I can't tell you I was an A student. But this is what I do know, that we need to look not just at what something cost, but what, when you put it in place, what it doesn't cost, what the avoided cost. We don't talk about avoided well, costs done, enough. Yeah. Yep. We don't talk about the avoided cost model. If I'm connected, if I'm better educated, if I am a better entrepreneur, I am not taking away, I am contributing more. If I have telehealth services and um, I, I don't um, you know, have to visit my doctor or if I, I can, if I get the, um, if I'm a connected to a device and, and I stand on the scale and I've gained one, uh, three to five pounds in a day, something is wrong. Maybe I have congenital heart failure. If you arrest that before I need an emergency yes. uh, service, yes. then you have yes. saved money. Yes. We need to think about these investments, not just how and where we allocate or write a check, but what we don't pay when these communities are connected. In Mississippi, you're going to lunch, I promise you. In Mississippi, you know, with, with a rural health care uh, uh, construct, small town, Ruleville, like a ruler, Ruleville, Mississippi, if my mind hasn't left me, they, the first year of this program of seniors, seniors, just 200 seniors, they saved 10,000 road miles, gas, mm -hmm. time, they saved about $300,000 in Medicaid you know, costs. There was one lady the year before went to the emergency room five times, zero times during this process. Mm -hmm. Think about quality of life and what you're saving. So when you go back home, continue to say, this is what it costs, but this is what it saves. And you need to look at that equation in its entirety in order to make this work. The numbers work. Yeah. I don't, you know, the numbers actually work, but we make, need to make sure that every single part of the equation is included uh, in that. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Mignon. very much. <laughs> <laughs> Mignon Clyburn, former commissioner of the FCC, she reminded us default to our North Star, secure agreement and collaborate and find common ground. Thank you very much for that passionate presentation. Much to be discussed. And you'll be able to discuss more with her over lunch, but not just yet, because I promise you, we're not ready for lunch just yet. We have two more presentations. You'll thank me later with all the steps you're making in the hotel and a later lunch. We're going to leave lose five pounds at Canto. It's a win-win. So at this time, we're going to welcome Antonio Correa, Senior RVP, Southern Europe, Caribbean, and Latin America for Mavenair. And he's going to be telling us about modernizing to withstand the test of time. 
Over to you, Antonio. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, hello. I promise I'm going to be short. I have a very short presentation, but it's going to be very uh, productive, I hope, for developing the Caribbean economy. Okay? Can you hear me well? Okay. My name is Antonio Correa. I just came from Europe. I've been there for 15 years. Uh, but I, I'm originally from this region. I've been working in the Caribbean and Latin American region for another 15 years, working in the past with Northern, with Lucen, Alcatel Lucen, and now with Mavenir. But before I start, just based on the feedback I received on, for the last two days, just let's put it in perspective, the telcos uh, sector vendors. There are five vendors worldwide that provide end-to-end -end solution in the tel telco sector. There are two, are Europeans that you know, Nokia Ericsson. There are two Chinese, Huawei CT. There is one American end-to-end -end, end -end telco provider, which is Mavenir. So we are part of a portfolio that can fulfill end-to-end -end solution. So with that, let me start. And when we think about the Caribbean for the rest of the world, this is what we think about. That's, uh, that's beaches, that's weather, have fun. But we are here to talk about the Caribbean economy. I want to provide you a global perspective and bring ideas that you can actually apply in the Caribbean. And of course, focus, focus on the telco sector. How can we modernize the, the network? So the Caribbean is a very different region to any other region in the world. You have the Canto member had big responsibilities, big challenges, because you have big islands with a very large population, more than 11, 12 million uh, population. But at the same time, you have countries, uh, islands with less than 5,000. Uh, this is uh, even increased uh, challenges when you add the visitors. You have air and cruise ships arriving that in some cases, particularly the small island, can multiply the uh, people in the island for five, 10 times. And this had a big impact also into the economic Caribbean nowadays. So we have a GDP, perhaps in the Caribbean, you have one of the highest ARPU, or highest GDP per capita in the world. And you have also at the same time in the same region, the Caribbean region, one of the lowest ARPU. So that brings challenges, so one no recipe fit to er everything. And of course, this affects the telco art pool. I, I can say there is one common denominator that you still enjoy nowadays, which is the art pool in the Caribbean is, is still high compared to other places in the world. You look into Latin America, art pools are mostly in all countries below $10. If you look into India region, for example, art pool is to be like $2 or, or even less. So with that, let me uh, just compare this Caribbean economy with the global economy, to put into perspective. You have seen for the last 50 years the, the, the visitors visiting or traveling and visiting Caribbean compared to the global trend. It has been growing continuously. So this is a trend, except during COVID times, which is a uh, few years back, where we have actually big lessons learned uh, that affected not only the Caribbean economy that relies a lot of tourism, but also affect governments, how to react, the importance of the telco infrastructure to actually provide the facilities to uh, address those uh, communication to the people, to keep students uh, connected to the institutions, to keep uh, the industry uh, producing and, and, and active during those remote times that we all suffered. So looking into the Caribbean economy, I can say that out of the 26 islands, uh, at least half of those, half of the, uh, have more like 40% GDP depending on the tourism. If we compare that to the world, there is a statistic that by the end of next year, 50% of the global GDP will come from or will be generated by digital economy. That you have been listening a lot during the last couple of days. So just to put into common language to everybody, I'd like to simplify it for you to remember easily. So four letters, A, B, C, D. A stands for artificial intelligence, machine learning, that you have heard a lot. 
uh, which is very important because this brings also automation into the tech, telco sector. B stands for big data. Big data, data is the new gold that we have. Uh, when I was a child, I remember the GDP of a country was relying on natural resources. So you had gold, you have oil, oil and gas, that is also people in the Caribbean. You have natural resources like beaches. You can attract tourism to actually develop your economy. Now the new goal is data, and, but you need to bring intelligence in order to modernize it. C is for cloud computing. So all this infrastructure, all this software, because digital economy relies on software, people developing intangible assets is not a natural resource, a natural capital. This needs to go to uh, cloud computing. And last one is uh, digital infrastructure. And I want to focus on digital infrastructure because this is the base for all of the above. So digital economy uh, can continue to be developed if we had the right proper digital infrastructure, which is important. And this is where all the government are, are, are putting a lot of focus, and this is the reason why. This 50% global GDP relies on deploying a good digital infrastructure. So this is not just 5G, but all together with those what they call innovating platforms that are, uh, are creating this accelerated growth that you can see in the economic growth that is happening around the globe. So looking into the telco sector in the Caribbean, you benefit 20 plus years ago uh, introducing 2G, 3G. And you saw the economic growth at that time because of voice, because dates some data, messaging, international call roamings, you have a lot of visitors, so that creates some wealth. But uh, looking into this region, it is a local complaint. This economic growth flatted or actually disappeared because of the OTTs that you heard also this morning. And there is little investment into 4G. They put 4G, of course, you can get video, you can have high uh, definition or high quality voice, but there is little investment there. And that had not, pre uh, uh, incorporated into the Caribbean market yet, it's with some extensions, as you heard from cable and wireless, but, but moving into 5G, voice continue to be an asset that you, you have, so uh, we will need to do some investment also into Volte or 4G moving forward. So again, let me focus on, on 5G and cloud and AI to increase digital productivity. I put this uh, hurricane storm happening because Caribbean is very familiar with this situation that happens every year, and we just suffer uh, with Hurricane uh, Barrel recently. So this is also happening in the telco sector, and that's why governments and, is, uh, and regulators are actually putting a lot of focus. If in the Caribbean this investment is frozen, in the rest of the world it's not. Actually, the, the European Union, uh, America, uh, China, I mean, they are putting a lot of focus on creating this battle or this uh, storm between countries to make sure that uh, the countries develop and succeed moving into 5G. Why? Because this is what I said before, the base of the digital economy. So looking into the logo of Canto, so our uh, digital economic growth, I would like to highlight because of these um, uh, recent activities in terms of digital economy, we have already achieved at the end of last year in 2023, 46% of uh, contribution to the GDP that represents 41 trillion uh, US dollars coming from 51 countries based on those technologies. Last couple of words, we have been already into 5G worldwide more than six years. We are already talking about 6G. And now, uh, very surprised Caribbean, I, uh, I've been visiting the region, is still doing investments in 3G. 3G is already sunset, it's already shut off in several big countries. Why? Because from all the Gs, 3G is the most expensive uh, to produce or to manage uh, traffic data voice. So they sunset first 2G, uh, sorry, 3G, they have plans already to sunset 2G in the next few years. They are keeping 2G just because of maybe some terminals uh, that is still uh, keeping for roaming voice or even for IoT. But the intention is to sunset 2G because from all the nowadays, 5G is the one that actually brings all the benefits, the lower cost. We had a, um, we had a, um, a conversation with the CTO in India recently, uh, with one of the largest operators in India. 
where I said the ARPU is $2. And he said, they are deploying, and you can see in the news, uh, 5G massively in India. Why? Because that's bringing the broadband. They are leaping frog from the fiber to mobile fiber with 5G, because 5G has the capabilities to actually make it happen. And they also, uh, this city also mentioned, they did an analysis, and the way that they have deployed, they, they actually found the only way for them to increase uh, economic value is if they had a social low ARPU, if they reduce the cost with 5G, they actually increase their margins. And that's how they're doing. So this is a big lesson learned that actually 5G, as I said, it brings the lowest uh, cost per bit in the industry nowadays, where they are putting that. So where are we with 5G today? This, those are the statistics from GSMA that you may have seen also this morning. We already achieved in five years 1.5 billion, within 4G took nine years. We already had more than 300 networks live. We have almost 40, uh, sorry, 38 40% of the 5G global population covered. But there are some challenges that you have been listening Sunday, Monday, this morning. Uh, and I'm very glad that before, before me this morning, there was a representative from different countries talking about this. So let me highlight a, a couple of those ones that I have in the presentation. So the European government is actually putting a lot of focus and effort and actually funds uh, or grants that they are giving to universities, to institutions, to startups, to attract local talent to develop this software. Because whatever they develop for these open architectures, together with Open RAN, together with uh, AI, together with, uh, with, um, with this uh, digital economy, uh, not only serve the local government that is giving the funds, not only serving the local country, but it's, this technology can apply worldwide. So that's why the economy is growing so fast in this area. Same with the US, you have heard some, uh, other representatives here uh, today. Government U.S. is making sure that uh, the new networks deployed in 5G are open, which by default, by the standard, has to be open. I'm glad that uh, Mavin is a big promoter from day one of open architecture, uh, and we are very well recognized because of and run. Uh, but I'm glad uh, governments are pushing that, making sure that the architectures moving forward are open, because that brings competition, that brings new developers, that brings a new application that you can benefit from. Uh, making sure that those networks are open and are also secure. Uh, so, and we have, as I said, Mavenir is leading on the, on the open solutions. Uh, I'm glad that Nokia also announced it and Ericsson announced it last year to move into that direction. So they said 5G cannot happen if you continue to have a vertical siloed uh, application. If you had a country that you have you want to increase competition, you have to split it north and south. You give one, one side of the country to one vendor, one side of the country to another vendor. With our horizontal approach, you can actually mix and match. And that's what actually Open Run is happening. Okay. Two examples in countries in Latin America. You heard Anatel this morning uh, from Brazil. They actually changed the cost of the spectrum to actually uh, having a, a incentivizing the operators to give rural coverage because that's important. That brings uh, wealth to the country. Mexico, you also heard one is perhaps one of the examples that actually uh, brings one of the most expensive spectrum air that the uh, operators are having, and that's preventing to the uh, evolution into 5G. Let me accelerate, I'm looking to Canto. This is a congratulations to Kando. You achieved more than 600 uh, participants in, into this event, and mostly distributed between MNOs and governments, some vendors and other participants. But if you look into the MNOs that are government-owned, actually the majority is, is government institutional regulators. That you have greater responsibilities also to act into that direction. And the topic that we have been discussing that resonates with Barcelona. Uh, with all the announcements on AI, everybody is talking about that. In, at the end of February, also Canto Connect was talking about the same topic, but I was surprised seeing news like this, no money for 5G. So everything that I've been saying, so in no money, no digital infrastructure, no digital sustainable growth, okay? So 
just to contribute some ideas. What is happening in the rest of the world? And you can benefit from this. So policy focus needs to change from use as consumption, what you used to be, what you continue to do in the 2G, 3G world. You need to go to data monetization. You need to actually get value into the data. You produce a lot of valid data that the OTTs are using. You should actually benefit from that. Second one is digital productivity. As I said, fictional access is one of the proven use cases that actually you can monetize. It's very easy for the Caribbean, instead of laying out fiber, to actually uh, use uh, wireless connections instead of digging into very hard rocks in the coral. There are a lot of government or educational or uh, application already developed that you can also benefit from there. And Canto, had the responsibility of the Oran the GSM is promoting all of that. To conclude, a couple of words about Mavir, but I have to say, all of these initiatives that Mavir is promoting is because world, uh, the worldwide internet was born open. It's already open. And because of that, all the applications, all the Androids, all the uh, uh, Apple, Apple Store is open by definition. There is no question now that all the infrastructures that go to the uh, data centers is open. You want to lay down all the applications in the telco world, all the core, security, bus goes into a standard uh, cross hardware. The only thing that was not open was the RAN. And RAN consume like 80% of your CAPEX and OPEX. So that's why Open RAN is becoming so popular in the market. That now in the end, all our portfolio that you had in the middle here, we provide end-to-end -end solution with uh, open architecture, open core, open run. Okay. With this, you want to promote uh, modernization in the sector, uh, you can rely on Mavenir to modernize the core, to introduce open run, to introduce competition. I like competition. We are, as I said, US-based uh, company, fully supported with uh, trusted architecture. And last message, you have the assets. You need to bring the people that will enable this digital productivity. But you need to give them the tools. Other countries are promoting those called the visas with some tax incentives. You have the asset to actually attract people, but you need to enable them by providing broadband. If they are connected, they can work from any place in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Antonio. 5G plus AI leads to a better life and productivity. We have to have our people connected. Another round of applause for Antonio Correa, Senior RVP, Southern Europe, Caribbean, and Latin America for Mavenir. Okay. You're wondering what was whispered to me. So what was whispered to me is that we can actually go to lunch now. <laughs> so we're going to take our lunch break right now, and then we will return with our agenda. Remember to, um, to swipe your, ax your barcode on your name card so that you have a chance to win the two-night stay at Bahamar. And there is a very exciting prize that I have in my hand for the first person who returns to the room after lunch. 